It was a bitter moment for the junkie Yorkshireman. He had gone across to France in the autumn of 1939, had kicked his heels during the months of what came to be known as the Phony War. He had fought his way to the beaches of Dunkirk, had been ferried to safety by the flotilla of small and large craft, which had made history when they took some 300,000 men to safety from under the German guns. He had taken part in a daring sabotage raid in Norway, had helped scotch the German efforts to perfect the V-2 rockets, and to be taken prisoner in the North African desert was a shattering blow to his pride. He dropped his captured weapon to the sand, raised his hands and stared at his captors. One kept him covered with a rifle, while the other came forward to search him for other arms. Both men were smiling. It is bad luck, mine friend, the pilot said, when Curly had been marched back to the Feisler stork. You are escaped prisoner of war. Curly grinned defiantly. Do I look it, he asked. I'd say I was a blinking prisoner of war. Yeah, yeah, that is so, the pilot smiled. But what I ask is, you have been escaping, yeah? You have already been a prisoner once. Look, I'm supposed to give you my name and my number, Curly said quietly. If you would like to give me a cigarette, that would be fine. The second German produced a case, and Curly's eyes gleamed at the sight of cigars. We look after the soldiers of the German Reich, the man said. Nothing is too good. Hmm, I'll tell you whether I agree with you in a minute, Curly said, passing the cigar in front of his nose and sniffing cautiously. Well, it doesn't smell too bad. You English, the two Germans were chuckling at Curly's precautionary sniff. What do you think the, the cigar is made of? Cabbage leaves? Could be. Curly took the offered light and nodded after a few puffs. The cigar smoked very well. While his captors were looking at his paybook and one or two letters and photographs from his wallet, Curly sat down and smoked. He looked quite content, but behind the expressionless eyes, his brain was working overtime. He was wondering if the tiny aeroplane could possibly take him and his two captors. If it could not, and the pilot took off leaving the other man to guard the prisoner, Curly thought there might be a chance. Everything depended on how long it took for a German lorry to reach them. The pilot walked over to where Curly's ration box lay. His eyebrows went up when he lifted the box. When he dumped it on the sand by the side of the plane, he turned to the Yorkshireman and said incredulously, You have carried this from the coast. It is very heavy. You're telling me, was the Dar retort. But when a bloke is hungry, he'll manage all sort of tricks, won't he? You're very strong, was the only comment. The Germans chattered in whispers for a moment or so. Then Curly was ordered to climb into the plane. Somehow the second man squeezed in behind their prisoner after swinging the two-bladed propeller. The engine was revved up, yellow dust swirled all about, and the Feisler began to trundle along. The pilot, knowing he was carrying much more than the normal load, did not try to get off the ground until the plane was racing along at close to a hundred miles an hour. Curly was not thinking about escaping then. He was scared. At the back of his mind was a fear that they would get into the air and then crash. He had seen light aircraft take off and they had just seemed to float in the air after a takeoff run of a mere 30 or 40 yards. His eyes were fixed on the pilot's hands. He held his breath when the man put the stick forward. The tail lifted easily enough. Then as the stick was drawn back, the Feisler lifted. The vibration ceased. A few moments later there was a bump. They lifted off the desert again. Once again they bumped back. The third time when the engine was screaming at peak revs, they remained airborne but flying very soggily indeed. The pilot began to turn to come round for a run north to the coast. Curly was holding his breath. The port wing had dipped and its tip seemed to be only a matter of inches from the ground. If it touched, there would be an immediate pile up and in this terrific heat a fire would be certain. Round in a slow circle they went and it was as they were straightening out the man in whose lap Curly was sitting gave a screech. Hands, hands. When there was no reply from the pilot, he reached past Curly and dug his friend sharply in the neck with a stiff forefinger. The pilot half turned and looked to the south where his friend was pointing. Curly had opened his eyes and he too looked. They were now about 50 feet from the ground. Across the desert, leaving behind a plume of yellow dust, a vehicle was racing towards them. Good, good, good. The man occupying the second seat with Curly almost crowed with relief when the pilot gently put the nose of the plane down and in a matter of 30 seconds had made a bumpy landing and brought the Feisler to a stop. It will be better to go back on four wheels, eh? Hans, the pilot said, wiping the sweat from his forehead. My friend, you do not know how near we have been to crashing. It was 
how you say it in English, touch and go, is that it? Corai was waiting for us to touch, Curly agreed, and I knew what it would have meant if we had. We'd have gone all right. Anyway, give me four wheels or my own feet. Look, and now there was a twinkle in his eyes. If you're in a hurry, I'll walk it back. The two Germans frowned, then grinned as they realised Curly was indulging in a leg pull. Oh, we would not dream of tiring you, said the pilot. There are now three lorries coming here. I saw two others as we were coming down. There has been a big search for you and your friends. How many are there in your party? Shall we say less than a thousand? Curly chuckled and winked. They got out of the plane and Curly was offered another cigar, the German saying. Maybe you will not get many smokes when you are in the POW pen. That is the fortune of war. But you will see that men of the Africa Corps are, how you say it, chivalrous. Yes, that is it, chivalrous to a defeated foe. When we have won this war, I hope German and English peoples will be good friends. There's only one thing wrong with what you said, Curly retorted, spitting out a fragment of cigar leaf. When we have won the war. That is foolish talk, Hans pointed out. Look at you, you are a prisoner. The German lorry comes now, you see it? Off you go, and not until their war is over you will be free again. Look, I shall give you my name and address. I think you are a brave man. When the peace comes, write to me, yes? He tore a leaf from a small notebook, scribbled for a moment, then handed the paper to Curly. Ta, I'm not much with a pen, but if I manage to keep this, I'll drop you a line. Thanks for the cigars, I'll maybe see you again one day. And he held out his hand. He shook hands with both Germans, then turned to watch the approaching truck race up. The landscape behind was blotted out by rolling clouds of yellow dust. A German sergeant jumped down from the cab, hurried forward, and clicking his heels gave a salute before asking, You have caught a British array, sir? Yes, put him in the lorry. Take that box as well. I'll report to base that one man has been caught. Have you seen any others? For a moment Curly thought the German seemed to hesitate. Then he shook his head. We saw nothing until we noticed that your plane was circling. We thought you must have seen something, so came up as quickly as we could. Are there any special orders? Do we take the prisoner in now or continue to search for others? Hans consulted with his companion, then told the sergeant he would continue his search. The Feisler would be returning to refuel and no doubt would be ordered back to signal the search trucks if other prisoners had been caught. The sergeant saluted, jerked a thumb towards the lorry, and Curly, picking up the carton of tinned food, walked round to the tailboard. He heaved the box over the back, heard a grunt, and turned to look at the German sergeant. The man's expression never altered. Curly shrugged and swung himself up and over the tailboard. Half in the lorry, he stared, his eyes goggling. Sitting there nursing a Smizer Tommy gun was Sam Foster. At the front of the truck, peering through a tiny slit in the brown canvas covering, was China Brown. He too had a gun. Come in and don't bother to shut the door, Sam whispered, chuckling softly. Sergeant Horace is at the wheel, wearing an Africa Corps cap and trying his best to look like a jerry driver. Curly fell over the tailboard into the lorry, bumping his knee on the precious box of food. He was later to discover it was packed with tins of compressed beef and some German bullets. The lorry creaked a little as the German sergeant got in beside Ted Horace at the steering wheel. Then the starter whirred, the engine came to life and there was a slight grind as Ted fumbled into first gear. Keep your nut down, Sam pleaded as Curly knelt up. Don't be daft, Sam, Curly snorted. I'm going to wave at those Jerry airmen. Look at this cigar, I have a couple of them. Anyway, they'll expect me to wave at them. The lorry started forward with a jerk and a few moments later rolled past the Pfizer. Hand and his companion were standing there, smiling, and when Curly raised himself to his feet and waved at them, their response was immediate. Both Germans waved back. That's what some educated blokes call psychology, Curly chuckled, still waving. We leave those two Jerrys in a good humour. They have been nice to a prisoner, see. It makes them feel good when I wave back to them. So when they find out later on that the POW wasn't a POW at all, it'll just knock them for six. Hi, there's another lorry, he said, and when Sam peered cautiously over the tailboard, he saw that another lorry was driving hard across the sand towards the Feisler. Well, we know there'll be real Jerrys in that one, Sam, Curly said, sitting down. All we've got to do now is keep the truck rolling and we're in the clear. Ted did keep his foot down for half an hour, then break to a halt. In that time, Curly had learned what had happened after their little scheme at the rest house had come unstuck. Ted, China and Sam had moved quietly away. They had waited for a little while on the road east, hoping Curly might be able to join them. 
Then as it became apparent that either Curly was putting up a terrific fight or the Germans were firing at each other, they moved off. They had stopped the lorry they were now in half a mile down the road and had forced the German driver to take them over the escarpment onto the desert. A dozen miles inland, Ted had stopped the lorry and dumped a corporal and two men. He had allowed them to drink deep from their own jerry can of water, then given them the direction back to the coast road. Their German sergeant had to stay, for Ted thought the man might be useful. Ted's the absolute berry, Sam said admiringly. He seems to know just what is going to happen. For instance, when we saw that little plane, oh, about an hour and a half back, he said at once it was probably looking for you. Then when it landed, he said right away that they'd spotted you. What did you think? Curly asked, tossing the last half inch of German cigar over the tailboard and winking at China. Oh, I thought so too, Sam agreed. After all, they didn't know where we were. Probably didn't know we existed. I guess straight away they'd spotted you. Well, now there you are, Sam. Curly chuckled. You're just as smart as Ted. One day, my lad, you'll find yourself with a stripe in your arm. Lance Corporal Sam Foster, eh? That'll be the day. Not me, Sam shook his head. I couldn't order people about. He was still praising Sergeant Ted Horace when the truck ground to a stop, and Ted called them to get down. The German sergeant looked anxiously at the four men, as if he was wondering what they would do to him. The four certainly looked a tough bunch. They all needed a shave, and the yellow dust of the desert, thick on face and hair alike, somehow added to their appearance. Ted consulted his compass and began to murmur to himself. Finally, he looked at the German sergeant and asked, How much petrol have we got? And before the man could reply, went on, How many miles running? What does she do to the gallon? The German could speak some English, but it took 10 minutes sorting out litres and kilometres before they got their answer. According to the German, the truck carried enough petrol to take them at least 200 miles across the desert. That ought to get us within walking distance of the Siwa Oasis, Ted murmured, and as if speaking to himself went on, Yeah, we should do it. There's water in the truck. We've got a certain amount of food, and, er, Curly, what was in that box you carried across from the plane? By the weight of it, lead, Curly assured him, grinning, though it's supposed to be food. I picked it up at the rest house last night. Open it, Ted ordered. We don't want to start a trip across the Libyan desert unless we've got enough grub to keep us going. The carton was opened, and there were some raised eyebrows when it was seen that several of the tins of beef had neat holes drilled in them, while from one tin the nose of a bullet protruded. Better than armour plating, Curly said, and explained how he had used the box as a shield before finally surrendering to the airmen. OK, we'll eat the punctured tins first, Ted decided. Right, hop aboard and we'll get moving. Wait a minute. Listen, pal. This to the German. I reckon it's about 20 miles to the coast road. Do you think you can walk it, or would you rather come along with us as a prisoner? The German sergeant frowned, not quite sure whether this ferocious-looking Britisher was serious. When he said he would rather get back to the coast road and his unit, Ted told Sam to bring out one of their jerry cans of water. Drink your fill, Ted told the German. Unless you meet up with a German lorry, it'll take a few hours before you get another drink. In five minutes, the German had drunk his fill, and the jerry can was put back in the cab. The German stood and waited while the fighting four got aboard. Then, unsmiling, he waved them goodbye. Once he was sure they were heading southeast, he turned and began to walk north. Twice he looked back, but the cloud of dust was still moving towards the shimmering horizon to the southeast. There was an argument in the back of the truck when it had only been moving a minute. Curly Bates began it by calling to Ted at the wheel. Hi hey Ted, what's the idea of this sewer oasis? You've forgotten something, haven't you? I don't think so, came the bellowed reply. What, for instance? What? Curly yelled, shaking his head at a puzzled Sam who was trying to salvage a rather sad-looking cigarette from his cough lozenge. What have I forgotten? Did you hear him, Sam? Then in an angry bellow he roared, Maybe you never heard of a CO named Corey? Major Corey? The best CO you ever knew? I thought we agreed to stick by him. Oh, him? And Curly could not see the grin on Ted's face. You know what the Navy chaps say. Pull on the oars, lads, I'm in the lifeboat. If we go back to the Wadi, the Jerry lorries will spot our tracks, and we'll all be in the stew. Got a cigarette, China? For a moment or so it looked as if Curly was going to explode. He got to his feet, hanging on grimly as the lorry swayed and bumped over the sandy waste. Then putting his face as close to the lorry cab as possible, he yelled, If that's your idea of sticking by a chap, Ted Horace, I'm through with you. Hear that? I'm through. 
You stop this truck, give me some water, and I'll take my box of bully beef. You can go to Siwa if you want, but I'm going back to the wadi. If I... The roar of the engine dwindled as Ted Horace eased his foot from the accelerator pedal and called out, You pudding-headed Yorkshireman, Curly. If you had any brains, I'd ask you to use them. But as you haven't got the sense of a horsefly, I'll explain. We're not, repeat, not going to Siwa Oasis. But this stretch of desert is probably going to be lousy with jerry lorries and maybe planes as well looking for us. Do you want them to know the Major is in the wadi? Or would you rather they thought we were beating the guts out of this truck in an effort to get to Siwa? Sam, talk to this nitwit and explain that as soon as it's safe we're going to turn around. Curly sat down glowering. He was still staring silently over the back of the lorry an hour later when Sergeant Horace eased the vehicle to a stop. He then came round to let down the back flap. With a dirty forefinger he beckoned Curly to get out. What do you see back there? he asked, pointing the way they'd come. How many sets of wheel tracks? One, Curly said dourly. Then turned as Sergeant Horace pulled him by the t- arm to look at the northwest. How many sets of tracks there? Curly shrugged. There were dozens of vehicle tracks. Despite the occasional storms and the furious winds which sometimes swept the desert, the tracks of trucks and jeeps remained fairly clearly cut for months on end. From the air they were often as clearly visible as the main road. Now do you see why I talked like I did to that Jerry Sergeant? Ted asked patiently. There are going to be planes looking for us. They can follow one set of tracks as easy as you follow your nose to the cookhouse. But when they get to a spot like this, where there are dozens of tracks, they're not going to know whether we've gone on southeast and so over to Siwa as I said, or whether we turned back. He paused for a moment, then held out his cigarette case, saying, Sorry for being so snappy, Curly. Have a smoke. Curly took a cigarette, and there was a twinkle in his eyes now. He gave a little shrug and grinning sheepishly admitted, I'm a clot, Sarge. I ought to have known you wouldn't desert the Major. I didn't like you anyway. Good lad, Ted Horace clapped Curly on the shoulder with a friendly hand. Anyway, we're going to turn northwest now, and if we aren't spotted by a jerry plane, I reckon we ought to reach the Wadi and the Major by sundown at the latest. It was half an hour from sunset when they drove into the southern edge of the Wadi. Halting at the best spot for camouflaging, they jumped down and began to hack off brushwood with their heavy knives. They were all anxious to see how the Major was, but making their vehicle invisible from the air came first. It only needed one sharp-eyed pilot to spot them and the game would be up. Twenty minutes after pulling up in the Wadi, they made their way to the little cave they had dug out for Major Corey. Even the usually wise cracking China was silent. They had left a desperately wounded man for 48 hours. He had, it was true, some water, but he also had his revolver, and each member of the fighting four was wondering what they would find. As they walked silently towards the little cave, the figure lying there moved. A hand was lifted and a revolver pointed shakily in their direction. Okay, Major Ted said, dropping to his knees, an action copied by his three companions. It's me, Sergeant Horace, Sergeant Ted Horace. The shaking hand was allowed to drop onto the sand. A dirty pale face was lifted a little and the Major in a puzzled voice asked, How did you get back so quickly? Or have I been unconscious for a long time? According to my reckoning, it can't be more than 48 hours since Colonel Pomfret left me. Well, we... we didn't go with him, sir, Sergeant Horace explained. We thought we could get enough food and water to see us all through till they came back. What? Ted repeated what he had said, then half turned to take the jerry can of water from Sam and a cup from China. Like a drink of water, sir, I'm afraid we shan't be able to make a cup of char, but we have got some food. Major Corey's water supply had been finished for 12 hours, and he drank gratefully. The other three members of the fighting four began gathering wood for a fire. Curly's carton of pressed beef was opened again, and using a tin found in the captured German lorry, they began to prepare a thick meat soup. It was after the meal, when Major Corey had been made as comfortable as possible, that Ted Horace, flipping the stub of his cigarette onto the dying fire, exploded his bombshell by saying, We've got a very brave man here, lads, but the Major has just told me that he can't stick the pain of his wound out much longer. He's got this splinter of shrapnel somewhere near his spine. The least movement brings him sweat and agony. We can't wait until the boys back at base return. It'll be too late. Major Corey can't hang on that long. So I've decided to get hold of a doctor. Three heads lifted as if they'd been puppets worked by one string. Get hold of a doctor, China Brown murmured. You mean a Jerry doctor? I'm not fussed whether he's a Jerry or an Italian doctor, Ted replied quietly. Point is... 
I'm not giving orders now. I am asking which of you is willing to come with me to try and get hold of a doctor. If we don't get a doctor, the Major is as good as dead. Three hands were lifted. Not one of the trio had any idea what their sergeant had in mind, how he would try to get hold of a doctor, but they were willing to go with him anywhere and face any odds. It could mean the finish of all four of us, Ted said quietly. I've never heard of a doctor being kidnapped so far behind the enemy lines, but if you're willing, we'll have a go. Now listen carefully. Thank you.